In this tutorial, we will render our MIDI tracks to audio, then we will bounce those audio tracks to a single audio file that can be burned to an audio CD or uploaded to a website. In the past, in Digital Performer 5 or earlier, you had to use separate processes for each kind of track. The instrument tracks you could freeze, the reason tracks you had to actually record into an audio track, and if you're using outboard gear, you had to create audio tracks to record into. With Digital Performer 6, the MOS instrument tracks, like these, and the reason tracks, like these, can both be frozen in one step. Very simple. First off, you just select your entire sequence. I can do Apple A, select the whole thing. Audio, choose free selected tracks. And you see it actually plays the sequence and records each track as audio. done. I should be able to now disable all of my MIDI instrument and auxiliary tracks and hear all of the parts played exactly as I had mixed them. Let's find out if they're there. Sounds like they're all there. So now we can if we choose to, we could actually delete these other tracks. Now I'm going to just play disable them. The next thing we want to do is what's called bounce to disk. That will create a single audio file that we can use to burn onto a CD. But there are some safety precautions we should take to make sure our file doesn't become distorted and that it's at its maximum volume. So I'm going to add another kind of track. I'm going to add a master fader track. See that down at the bottom. There's our master fader. And in the mixing board, let me hide some of these so you can see it. Hide the ones we don't need anymore. Here's our master fader. I'm going to add an audio plugin, a Masterworks limiter. This will give us kind of a ceiling on our sound, so it'll keep the level from going above what's called 0 dB, where it would add digital distortion. Let's play a little of our sequence and see how it's sounding. able to boost the level a little bit and um, not hear any artifacts of the sound being muffled or any distortion or anything like that. So I'm going to create a ceiling of negative 0.2 decibels. That will make sure that no sounds going out to the master fader are any louder than negative 0.2 dB. That's a good safe range for our final file. You could add, if you like, any automation to your audio tracks, your rendered audio tracks, but since we did all our mixing with the MIDI tracks, it should sound just the way we want. One thing you should add, however, to your master fader so that your audio file doesn't have any pops or clicks added to it at the beginning of the end is a quick fade in and a fade out. So I'm going to do that in the sequence editor. I could actually do that also in the event list, but I'll start it in the sequence editor. Take my track, open the sequence editor, there it is down there. So I'm going to draw in some volume automation. Choose my pencil tool. I'm going to disable the grid so I can draw freely, and I'll start by just putting in a single point. Click volume in the insert, bring it up so it's visible to you. 
click insert, make sure I click volume, and just draw a point. And then I can add my automation to that. Take my arrow tool, I can move this point freely. And I'm going to put it up to a value. I can bring it up to 0 dB since I have the limiter on there. And you notice when I click on this point, up in the screen up at the top, it shows the location and it shows the value which is 0 dB. That would be a good value to have. It's beyond the scope of Music 8A to go into detail about decibels, so uh, we'll just use sort of preset values. Before that, I'll want to make a value of negative infinity. That means the sound is all the way off. So here we have this fade in. It's actually happening during the silence at the beginning. And then at the end, you could add a fade out. If you wanted your piece to fade out, the effect of a fade out, you could. Or you could put a quick fade out after the end of the last note to make sure there's no pops or clicks in your file. I'll add a fade out that actually is part of the music, and I'm going to do that in the event list. But before I do that, notice that this is a dashed line. That means that the automation is not play enabled for this track. So um, the way I like to look for that is within the mixing board window, but you could also click here where it says auto and click play, and now the automation is play enabled. Let's see how that looks in the mixing board. There's the play enable button there for the master fader. So as you can see, when I click this off, the automation goes away here, and this turns to dashes again. So we'll play enable the automation. And I'll now use the event list to add the fade out that I would like. I'd like it to fade out from measure 7 to measure 8. So go back to my tracks. I like that track using my shortcuts. Open the event list. Not many events in this, just volume events. And I'm going to add a volume event, and I know that I want it in measure 7. So I'll say measure 7. And I want it to be 0, which is where it was when I first brought it up at the beginning of the piece. Press return. And I've got another volume event here. Okay, I'm going to add one more. I'll put this in measure 8. And I'm going to make it negative infinity. And I'm going to just click hold the numbers and drag the mouse down. And you see it scrolls to negative infinity. Press return. And you probably saw this point jump in there. Now we have a fade in here and a fade out at the end. So let's hear what we have. All that added. So notice when the, the limiter was moving, it was going just a little bit into the red, but we couldn't really hear that effect. That's perfect. That means we're getting a nice loud file, but we're not changing the dynamic profile of the audio. It still has all its character. Okay, with our fade in, fade out, and our limiter on the master fader, we're ready to do our bounce to disk. That'll give us a single file. Simple process. Uh, select all your audio tracks. You can just do a select all if you want. Be sure that all of the outputs for your audio tracks and your master fader are all the same. That's right here. If you're working in the lab, it usually happens by default, but you want to check because when the bounce to disk process happens, it actually looks to see it chooses one of the output pairs and it will bounce everything that's on that output pair so it'll bounce everything here if this was set to some different output we would lose the track in the bounce so I've highlighted that Go audio bounce to disk we'll ask about the file format if you're going to burn to an audio CD you want to choose the AIFF or WAVE format uh, Wave is now kind of coming, becoming the universal both for Mac and PC, so you could choose that. This tells us our source. This matches these outputs here. So 7 and 8 will mean all of these tracks will be combined in our bounce. And it'll give it a title by default. It'll take the file name 
and add the word mix to it. Now, you also want to be aware where this file is going to show up. Normally, by default, it puts it in your audio files folder that's inside of your project. Okay, what does that mean? I'm going to go open the student disk. And here is my project folder. And if I look inside, we're now inside the project folder, you see all these different files I'm working on. And there's some additional folders. One of them is called audio files. If we look inside that, here's all the files we just froze, our MIDI files that are now audio files. And when we do our bounce to disk process here, when we click OK, it's actually going to create one more file and put it in this folder. That's the file that's going to be your mix file. You can burn to a CD, whatever. So we'll leave the default location for the bounce and say OK. You may ask some questions here. We can leave all these uh, as presets for now. It's OK. Just like when it did the freeze, it does the process. You see it happening. Now if we go back to that folder, we should see a new file. And there it is, Bounce Mix Wave File. Notice it has kind of a different icon to it. You could also do that process and create an MP3 file. And an MP3 file might be good for loading up on the web since it's much smaller, but it is compressed so you'll lose some of the sound quality. Now, if you want to burn this file to a CD, uh, one of the easiest ways on a Mac is just to drag it into iTunes and have iTunes burn the CD. So let's open iTunes real quick. All right, I'll start by creating a new playlist. So add this. This will be the playlist that will burn to the CD. Here it is. I'm going to check one preference before I drag my file in, and that is the file type upon import. That's down here in the General tab, Import Settings. I want to make sure that this says AIFF or WAVE encoder. That way you'll get a file that won't be compressed. So it'll be the best sounding file and appropriate for an audio CD. So I'll say WAVE encoder since that's what we made. Press OK. Now it's very simple. I just drag this mix file into the playlist. It will copy it into iTunes. There's our name of that our CD will have. There's our file. We can even check it by clicking play, see if we hear it. We should. And there it is. It's now a single file. So all I have to do now is click burn disk, follow the instructions, and I'll have a CD of my finished mix. Once you've completed all this work, you'll want to safely archive your Digital Performer project and Reason file onto a flash drive or some other removable media. There are two methods you can use to do this. Um, one that will keep all of the files that you made and if you made alternate versions or anything like that, anything that's in your project folder, you can save that or you can save the project as it now stands as a new file complete with the audio files and everything. So I'll go through the one I mentioned first, first. To do that I'll save what I have here. Check my reason file. Make sure that that's saved as well. And I'll quit both applications. It's important that you quit before you do this next process or else you might not copy the most recent version. I'll then open up my removable media, in this case a flash drive, and I'll open the student disk. And I see here is the project that I've been working on on the student disk. 
Here's an older version from my last session that's on my flash drive. I strongly recommend that you don't take the most recent version and just copy over the older version. You may lose some things you wanted to save. So I recommend first renaming the version that's on your flash drive if you have an older version. You could say uh, give it its date or you could say old or something like that. I'll say old version 1. Okay. That will remind me that this was the last version I had before I started working on this one. Then at that point you simply drag your entire project folder onto your flash drive. If I look in my project folder I'll see there is digital performer files and different files. It is not enough just to drag the digital performer file over. You need all the extra audio files that are part of that project. You'll need the reason files. You'll need all of that to be together if you want to reopen your project in the state it was left. So simply take this new, newest version of your project folder, drag it onto your flash drive, and allow it to copy. So here's my old version. Here's the one I was working on. If I was to work on it again in the lab, I would do the reverse. Copy it onto the student disk, work on it. Then I would rename this one on my flash drive as like old version 2. Then copy my latest version back onto my flash drive at the end of the session. That way I keep um, an archive of my older versions in case I need to go back. And maybe there's something that I liked in an older version that I erased and I want to retrieve it. Then I have it there. So that's one way that you can archive your project. The other way is to do a save a copy. So let's close this window for a moment. I'm going to go into the student disk and reopen what I was working on. That was this project here. I will say that when you use the save a copy in command, you won't be saving your reason file, just the digital performer file. So after you've done the save a copy in, you may want to go back and drag your reason file into that project folder as well. I'll show you that in a moment. So we're opening up the file just where I left it. I'll choose save a copy as and basically this is gonna just save a copy of this digital performer file the way it is very important that you check this box duplicate audio and copy shared samples that way this archive folder will contain all the ancillary files you need the audio files and all that so now I can choose the location I'll choose my flash drive um, I'll give it a new name it's my um, version 2 of this particular file and I'll choose save and now it's writing all that stuff in onto my flash drive now I'll quit digital performer I don't need to save again I've already saved and I'll open my flash drive and here is the save a copy in version that I just did it has my digital performer file, my audio files, remember those, they're all in there. If you do this process, you will want to make sure to separately grab a copy of the reason file and put it in that project folder if you want to archive that as well. So, to me the best method that assures that you're getting everything that's part of your project is to drag the project folder from the student files folder or from the student disk onto your flash drive after you have quit both digital performer and reason and I also recommend if you have older versions on your flash drive older versions of the project folder rename them as old versions so you don't copy over them